Good evening, and doesn't that garden look just about as wonderful as a garden should be and could be? And I couldn't be happier than to be, even though it's really chilly outside, to be sitting here tonight waiting to talk to the wonderful Sarah Raven, who is no stranger to 5 by 15 because she's come here and talked about her extraordinary book on flowers. And tonight, Sarah is going to be talking about her new book, which is not about flowers, but is in fact about vegetables. I can see that's not very well showing up, but it is called A Year Full of Veg, A Harvest for Every Season. Now, Sarah, as all of you know, is absolutely beloved by gardeners everywhere, not just because she produces the most amazing sweet peas, which I grow. She also produces the most extraordinary tulips, also which I grow. And I can tell you, if you get Sarah's peas and her tulips, sweet peas and her tulips, they will grow and they will produce exactly what they say, which is, can't be said, too many gardeners. Um, as I say, she came last and talked to us about her wonderful book about cut flowers, mainly and about how to arrange them. And so I was completely thrilled when into my lap arrived an equivalent book, but about vegetables. Now, Sarah has many principles which we're going to talk about. One of them, for instance, is that things should look beautiful in the garden, which I hope you'll agree. You all wanted to sit on that bench with the rosemary and you all wanted to be in that garden. And I bet you all wanted to eat that salad. But judging by how many of you have signed up tonight, I know that vegetables is a really big issue. So with no more ado, just except for to say that we will take questions. So please put them in and they can be as uh, straightforward as how do I get my rhubarb to uh, come up quicker or something super complicated about the mythology of the three sisters growing system which we might get to and please buy the book it's going to be available through our bookstore newer books and from all good books and it's a great thing for you to have and it's also a great thing as a present so welcome Sarah and thank, thank you, you so Rosie. much what well, thank you so much for being with us and thank you. Thank you very, very much for writing this book because it's quite unlike any book about vegetables, and I've read a few, that I have ever read. And that's partly because it does look so beautiful. Yeah, well, that, I'm, I'm so lucky that um, I've been photographing here where Adam and I live. Um, I'm married to Adam Nicholson, the writer, as you know, uh, for the last 30 years. And Jonathan Buckley is now a very dear friend, but I knew him a little bit. And he's been coming here once a fortnight uh, for 26 years since Molly, our uh, second daughter, was born. And um, so we have just the most incredible record of this place. And so when I decided that I wanted to write about veg. Um, there's an incredible gallery that he has that I can sort of access and I can just put in aubergine and then literally every aubergine that we have shot over the last two and a half decades come up into, onto my computer screen. So it was the most wonderful, wonderful thing to do um, last yeah. winter. No, yeah, last winter, um, just by sort of tapping into the, the bounty and beauty and color that we've accumulated over the years. So that's why it was really, I wanted to do a very beautiful veg book because I just think vegetables can be incredibly beautiful, both in the garden and on the plate. And uh, somebody who, I mean, I came from the River Cafe studio and was taught by Rose Gray and Ruthie Rogers. And there, uh, you know, how the food looks is, is, it's not fussy in any shape or form, but it, but it, it celebrates the vegetable. And, mm. uh, so for me, that's kind of my hinterland, I suppose, um, and is very important, yeah. So vegetables now, obviously, are incredibly, well, we're short of them at the moment, but I mean, it's very yeah. fashionable now to grow veg. But you started growing vegetables a long, long time ago, didn't you? Yeah, I did. So I was, I was a waitress at the River Cafe while I was training to be a medic at Charing Cross. So really, genuinely... I'm now 60, I was 60 the other day. And I was then, I was at medical school from the age of 24 to 30. And all through that time, I was a waitress at the River Cafe. And I lived just down the road in Ravenscourt Park. And I had a garden, luckily, in the back of this house. And I grew salads and herbs and tomatoes. So I grew them way before I started growing cut flowers. I started growing veg, actually. And so it's quite good for me in a way because that was a, that was the, my early start, but then now I have two adult children, and they really don't have time or space. They have window boxes, or what I encourage actually is water troughs from a sort of farm supply or ho or horse supply shop, because you get an awful lot for your money compared to a sort of rather bougie 
um, container from a garden center. And they cost 90 pounds and they're six foot long. So they're two meters long and they're really deep. And um, so you can fit tons of compost, which holds the water much better as well as the fertility. And they both have them in their back gardens and can pick salads and herbs. I mean, sometimes they fail to water them for two months. And so then they do look a bit crispy, but um, it particularly, funnily enough, between August and April, you don't need to water really, do you? Because the, the heavens do it for you. So um, yeah, I, I really like the urban thing of high production, minimal input, but, but you know, just be able to pick something every day for your plate. Yes, I mean that's what that's one of the big themes, isn't it? The the cut and come again. Can you just explain what that expression means, vegetable yeah. rice? Yeah. So people associate that with cut flowers where you take the leader above auxiliary buds and sorry, above a pair of leaves, sorry, and that forms auxiliary buds. Mm -hmm. But actually just the same applies. If you pick round a, a lettuce variety, particularly if it's an oak leaf variety, but you leave the heart intact what happens is that that heart then creates more leaves from the heart outwards. So as long as you pick ram rather than do what I call ka which is take mm -hmm. the whole thing, it just self-replenishes even in the winter. And all the plants, even that don't form heart, like salad rocket, all the mustards, like mustard red frills, um, all the, the both the purslanes and all these lettuce and flat leaf parsley, chervil, they all, but tarik, um, not tarik, I'm sorry, um, uh, I, oh, you know, the thing we use in um, in Asian cooking, coriander, there we are, I'm having a mind, but so they all <laughs> behave in that way. So as long as you leave the baby leaves, it will replenish the outer leaves. So you just pick the outer leaves. And that is what I mean. And the epitome of that is Swiss chard, which is a kind of slightly unfashionable vegetable, actually, partly because you can't buy it, apart from really good t Turkish greengrocers, because it has such a large surface area, it flops. So Sainsbury's, Waitrose, whatever, wouldn't ever stock it because it looks pretty dreadful on the shelf too quickly. But actually, it is the epitome of cut and come again, which is if you mm. harvest up the stem, just breaking off the leaves as you go, that heart almost becomes like a tree trunk with a tuft at the top. But that will keep replenishing even in the winter. So you can then move a Swiss chard to a literally 12 months round cropping plant from something that you might pick for three or four months. Well, that's amazing. How many? I mean, how how many of the herbs and the and the salad props? How many of them live all all year round? So the, the the perennials are things like mint and tarragon and chives and fennel and lovage, um, and so they die down in the autumn. They're herbaceous and they come up again in the spring. But an awful lot of the really lovely green, sort of more salady herbs like parsley, chervil, coriander, basil. Uh, fennel no not fennel dill fennel's mm. perennial they're all annual or biennial and so they have this habit which is that by picking the outer leaves and leaving the heart intact they will replenish and continually replenish and th those you just need to do two sowings so one in april and one in august in my view will keep you in most of those but basil of course is half hardy not hardy so you actually sow that in may and you'll only pick that till sort of middle of september and then it tends to go black because it really hates cold nights but all the others are hardy annuals and you really can sow and grow them pretty much all year but you should only have to do it two or three times to give you year-round cover and you divide the year up into two halves don't you yeah. again that that was kind of unusual to me because I still yeah. think in terms of four seasons and planting and sowing and blah 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 so how do your two seasons work it, it, it's just a thing that I kind of came up with to when I'm teaching it's just simpler and it is actually how it happens which is uh, uh, there are as many crops that thrive in cold grey dark wet conditions as and those are the ones you sow in August and they crop until April, as there are that are happy in sun, dry, heat. And those are the sort of half hardy. So the classic things like tomato, basil, runner beans, French beans, those sorts of things. But a lot of the plants that you can grow in the winter actually originate either from the highlands in, of Japan or China, and some of them are Mediterranean, but from high altitude. So, you know, the top of a mountain in Crete is where you'll find wild rocket, for instance, growing. 
And it's really, really frost resistant, as is flat leaf parsley, which is actually a biennial. And so I, I, I really think of my sowing mainly um, in April, that keeps me going until August mm -hmm. or even September, but and then in in then in um in in August to then keep me going right the way through late autumn, winter, and early spring. And if you just it's so much simpler. And so I just write out what I want to grow that year, and then I put them in each one or other of those categories. And then I've got a very simple sewing plan. And it's true that some things will do this thing called bolt, which is that they run up to mm -hmm. flower and then. And then they go bitter or they're not so nice. Um, and some things do that quicker than others. So the lettuces, I would do four sowings a year rather than two because they do tend to bolt if they get stressed and they just don't taste so nice. But actually, if you want to keep it simple, just if you have April and August stuck in your head, you'll be fine. So you grow an extraordinary amount of salad, as we could tell from that last picture. I mean, how many different types of salad do you produce? So probably at the moment out there, probably 20 to 30 different um, leaves, I, I, I guess. And it's, I mean, like we've probably got five or six different mustards. And so mustards are really brilliant because they're fantastic soil fumigants. And as an organic farmer, you probably, you may well have used uh, mustard. And it's mm. often used on a field scale to get rid of any buildup of either fungal or can even be pest disease. And um, and we just we just find it so tolerant here. So red frills mustard tastes of new potatoes, a wasabi mustard tastes of wasabi, like the wow. root, you know, horseradish. You know, there are lots of different ones. And then we grow two or three different rockets, which give you peppery. So you've got mustardy flavor, you've then got peppery flavor. And then you, um, I also love the Mitsunas, which is slightly sort of cabbagey in taste, you know, oriental um, sort of cabbage taste, like a stir fry taste. And then I really want to grow a background of different lettuces. So in the in the August sowing, I'll grow the hardies. So the Marvel of Four Seasons is one of my absolute favorites and Black Cedar Simpson, both those will give me leaves right the way through the winter. And then in the summer from my April to August sowings, I might move to something crunchier, like perhaps um, a cocard has a lovely texture, which is an oak leaf. Anyway, but, but so anyway, maybe four different lettuces, three to four different lettuces at any one time. And then salad herbs are incredibly important. So right now we're picking loads of sorrel, mm -hmm. loads of coriander. Coriander, people really misjudge. They think it prefers it hot and dry because we use it in Asian cooking, but actually it much prefers it cold, gray and dark. So coriander is widely misgrown and it bolts immediately in the heat. But also flat leaf parsley, as I said, chervil is something it will only germinate in September when it gets cold. It sits dormant through the summer months because it hates dry, hot weather. Mm -hmm. It germinates in September and will grow happily. So um, I might have an omelette after this and what will go <laughs> into it will be lots and lots of chervil. And the key thing with those herbs, and you probably all know this, so it's uh, teaching grandmothers to suck eggs, but they have very volatile essential oils. So when you're cooking with these soft green herbs, apart from parsley, you really only want to add them to the food when you're taking it off the heat. Same with basil, because they will just literally not only go sort of mushy, but also their flavor just goes. And it doesn't unfortunately go into the food often, it will actually go into the air. And so with all these things, I mean, particularly chervil, it has the most volatile of all, you want to have, you want to cook your omelet and then you want to literally just lay it before you flip back the omelet onto the other side. And then you'll have it in the middle of the omelet and it will just wilt down a tiny bit. So it's not fibrous when you come to cut it, but you don't want to give it any more heat than that. And that is also absolutely fundamentally true of coriander. And that's why in a good restaurant, you know, in a Thai restaurant, you're just, it's just added to the soup or whatever, right. You know, as it goes onto the table rather than in the pan. And I think, we quite a lot of us um, misuse those green herbs in that way. Yes, I think we do. What about like English parsley? Should you not cook that? Should that yeah, go so, at the end? So parsley and uh, both the parsleys are much more robust, which is why oh. we have parsley sauce. Exactly. So, so, exactly. So they um they will really take some cooking. They don't have to be cooked, as we all know from tabule and things, mm, but mm. but they will take cooking. Yeah. Um, you, when you're not growing salad, you, you have an expression that you should grow the unviables, which I yeah. really liked the, the sense of, of, there's no point more or less in growing something that is completely freely, freely available and also takes up a lot of room. 
like yeah. a large cabbage or something. So what do you not grow uh, I on think that brand? Yeah, it's, it's as important to think about what not to grow as what to grow. Because when you're starting out, particularly, you just tend to think, oh, well, I'll grow what's in my greengrocer's mm. basket. I'll grow what I eat. But actually, of course, if you think about it, something like cabbage or even something like celeriac, which is such a lovely vegetable right now, they need to be in their ground really for nine months before you can harvest them. So why would you give a meter of ground to give you, let's say, two calendars of that vegetable in the whole season and the whole right. year? Um, because they need to be there for so long when you can buy them. And the honest truth is, if I fed you all some of the cabbage that I had grown or that we had bought from a good greengrocer and similarly with celeriac, you wouldn't be able to tell. So let farmers grow the things that farmers should grow. You know, let small scale, you know, farmers market suppliers grow some things. But what I would really advocate is use your precious space and your precious time to grow the things that you really can't buy easily. And so for me, it's tiny courgettes. So it's again, it's something that Rose Gray taught me is measure a courgette by the base of your thumb. And so it is literally, you know, it's sort of eight centimeters or whatever long, isn't it? And why not pick them when they're at their very best rather than those horrible things that you buy at the supermarket? Because the point is they're cut and come again. So the more you pick, the more will come. So you might as well pick them like this rather than like this because leaving them longer just delays the production of more babies coming along behind. And so, you know, just, just have them at their best, but also concentrate on things that you can't buy. I mean, if you live in the Stoke Newington, like one of my closest friends, she's got the amazing Newington green, green grocers, and she can get everything that I grow pretty much. But in East Sussex, I can't buy Bellotti beans in August mm-hmm. and September, but I adore them. So even though they're not high producers, they look wonderful and they taste so creamy, fresh um, bolotti beans. They're just fabulous. And similarly, baby broad beans, you know, they're just, they're exquisitely delicious. And so I, I really concentrate on high production, but absolutely definitely next flavor and that you can't buy that flavor. They are going to taste barn door different. So that applies to a new potato, doesn't it? Because the starch changes its quality the longer it's away from the ground. It does. So it's the sugars in a new potato or an asparagus or a carrot or famously a pea. So Findus used to, their advert used to be a great lorry out in the field with all the peas coming into the lorry down a chute and then driving off to the industrial park into the freezer. And they would claim that that journey would have taken less than half an hour. And that's because in peas, lots of varieties, the sugars turn to starch incredibly readily. So they become like a lentil or Mm -hmm. a marrow fat pea, you know, a mushy pea. And I remember really well seeing a Montague Don on on Gardener's World in the very early days, or maybe it was when he did that wonderful program, Fork to Fork. Anyway, I remember he had the pan on the boil in his beautiful kitchen uh, with salt already in the water and mint already in the water. And he went out and dug his potatoes and he ran down the path with his calendar of, his calendar of potatoes because he was thinking of all those sugars turning to starch literally in his journey and in they went straight away into the sink wash into the pan and that's because sugars turn to starch at different rates in different vegetables but the ones that we really want to grow are the ones where they turn most readily and quickly and a wonderful experiment I once did um, with a with a group here when I was teaching was I got a spear of asparagus that we picked in the garden it, it literally just 10 minutes before I'd already bought some from a farm shop the day before mm-hmm. so it probably been harvested two days maybe and then I bought some from Sainsbury's or somewhere that had been flown in from Guatemala and you know it said used by da 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 which was still way down but and we then I'd got some iodine from the chemist and I stained I, I put the dye the iodine onto each of the spears cut in half and the one from the garden here remained bright green didn't take up the iodine at all the one from the farm shop it sort of got a shadow sort of fogging of dark on it but the one from Guatemala went absolutely jet black <clears throat> so that's exactly showing it it's showing you that what is happening in that spear of asparagus is the sugars are turning to starches 
So what are the other things that you would say were unbuyables that are real treats to you in the summer or the winter for that matter? I mean, I do think corn on the cob um, is, is wonderful sweet corn, but it, it is the rat's favorite. And if we have hens um, inspired by Arthur Parkinson and um, we have quite a lot of hens and I have gone out and, and seen a rat sort of having a good old gnaw up of my, <laughs> my sweet corn, but I love it. I love mm. that thing again, because it's just so much sweeter. Um, definitely peas. There's a variety called Nairobi that I'm obsessed with, which is actually a sugar snap. And it's it converts much slower than others. Um, it sugars into starch. But I would say peas. Um, I mean, almost everything a bit, but it's particularly uh, peas, um, uh, carrots, of course, as well. Not so much beetroot. So they they they're slower. Asparagus next, and new potatoes next down in the rung, um, and sweet corn. So those are the ones that are really really important. And then tomatoes. Um, which are, of course, so current at the moment. In, 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 we're, they're all stored in uh, most places, not always, but they're in a fridge or they're in a, one of those cold units where there's sort of mm -hmm. fog coming out over it. And that's a disaster because that promotes the conversion of the sugars in the tomato to starches. And so, again, I mean, that's why I would always advocate if you have a greenhouse, it absolutely should be packed to the gunnels from May and so they do need sowing in April, so or a bit earlier actually, but from May, June time until August, September, when you're doing your swap over, they should be packed to the gunnels with tomatoes because they 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 need to be warm for their sugars to be there rather than converting to starch. So as soon as they get cold, they start converting their sugars to starches. That. That's so really interesting. And if you buy them, put them out on a window ledge or even put them on you know, like the agar or, or, or the wood burn or whatever, just to not to cook them, but just to heat, just to bring them up. And then the sugars will be much more. They'll be released and it'll be much sweeter. It's why they're so completely delicious. If you just um, bake them in the oven with olive oil for about an hour and then they become like a magical taste. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They're just a vegetable that doesn't suit cold. You know, never, ever, ever serve tomatoes from the fridge. <laughs> Okay, um, <laughs> you you do a lot of experiments with all your seeds, don't you? I mean, how I know you do them with your flowers and your tulips and and uh, all the wonderful flowers. Have you done the same with all your veg or with some yes. of your veg? Yeah, very much so. So particularly for flavour. So so we're we're kind of what what's happened since I started. I mean, this was all starting thirty five years ago, but it's become much more prevalent is that the varieties that are available to the average domestic grower tend to be ones that have been selected for the commercial grower, even if it's a sort of smallholder. Uh, and it's because of travelability. So that mm -hmm. they, the fact that they will, they will store in the fridge, they won't bruise, that kind of thing. So that they generally travel quite well. And of course, to us as the domestic grower eater, it doesn't matter two hoots how they mm -hmm. travel. And so that is that is really uppermost in a lot of uh, variety selection, whereas for most of us domestic eaters, you know, we want flavor uppermost, product, probably productivity mm -hmm. next, and then and then ease of growth, basically, you know, they're, they're pretty easy without being high tech, including easy germination. And so whenever we trial here, that's our list of priorities. And so we'll then do. We'll try and gather together 10 or 12 people. For instance, if we're doing a tomato trial, let's say, and you do get quite bored of tomatoes when you're tasting them. And then you're sort of slightly, you can't quite work out which you like really in the, in the end. But we try and do this thing of being not knowing what the variety is, so not being blindfolded, but you don't know what it is. It's cut up in the same way, served with a tiny bit of salt, tiny bit of olive oil, which brings out the flavors. And then you have to give them a mark out of 10. And then our grower will give them a mark out of 10. It might be me, it might be our vegetable grower here called Anita um, for productivity and general ease and how they've performed. And so we then keep quite detailed notes so that then when often a customer or, or a friend or whatever will say, oh, Sarah, have you tried this one? We can go back into the file and look, oh yeah, we did. We trialed that 12 years ago and it was rubbish for us. Mm -hmm. If you're saying it's great, we'll, we'll trial it again. And so certainly for the salads, probably we've trialed more here than most sort of commercial growers. So, you know, Sainsbury's the supermarkets will have their 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 grower trials. But certainly for a sort of domestic eater grower, we, we probably trialed almost more than any other, I would say. 
Um, and it's just because they're, I suppose, my central passion. And I, I pick and eat a salad at least twice a day, every day of the year. But, you know, um, I mean, at least once, but sometimes twice um, right. I'll have a salad. And do you mix your, uh, I know that the, the way that the garden looks is really important to you and indeed to anyone who has your books. Um, do you mix vegetables up with flowers? 100%. And, and, and partly it's the aesthetics, but also it's partly the health and the pollination. So again, I'm sorry if I'm teaching grandmother to suck eggs. No, no, I love all this. I'm learning all sorts of stuff. I thought I knew a bit, but feeling very, very abject over here. Um, well, keep mo going. <laughs> mo most, most of a, a sweet corn, we probably, most of us know, is wind pollinated, which is why you, you, you actually plant it in, in banks because it drifts, well, the wind drifts the pollen from one row into the next row and the next row. So you tend not to do it in rows, you tend to do it in blocks because it will cross pollinate. But almost everything else that we've talked about is actually insect pollinated. Mm -hmm. And so by, uh, obviously that isn't relevant when you're not growing it for the fruit or the bean or the whatever, but it is relevant if you're wanting to um, harvest seed. So even for the salads, that's also true. But so by putting in the flowers, you're drawing in the pollinators. And it's one of the very key things that I think um, a lot of people make mistake is they put their tomatoes in the greenhouse, but they don't put the flowers underneath. And it's so important, one, for companion planting, it keeps away or certainly massively decreases the white fly and green fly problem. But also it brings in the bumblebees and the bees, which then pollinate the tomatoes. So you have this sort of double bonus. And similarly out in the garden, it looks pretty, but it's actually really benefiting pollination and it's hugely benefiting pests and diseases. And one of the things that we've really started doing a lot of work on is using garden birds as our friends. So we used to inevitably, like most gardeners, lose quite a lot of our lettuce, mm -hmm. and, um, et cetera, to slugs and snails. But what we found is we, we found this plant called red millet that we were putting through our dahlias. And we found that it ripens at, um, it sort of ripens from August until October. And it, it, it sort of lives, it, the birds start to live in there. So we had tons of goldfinches living in our dahlia bed. And then what happens is that as long as you can hold on to them over the winter by loads of nesting boxes and hedges, so we've put in more and more hedges, not just for uh, good environmental reasons, but also to hold on to our birds. And hawthorn hedges are fantastic. So obviously I'm lucky because I'm on a farm, but hawthorn hedges are prickly. And so you don't get problems with foxes or badgers or whatever eating yeah. the nest. And so gradually over the last four or five years since we started this experiment, our garden bird population has really increased. And with that now, we just, we hardly, we have a sort of joke here. If anyone can see a slug or a snail, then they get a prize because we just don't really have them because so the birds then emerge and in, in um, March, April and May, which is just when things are most vulnerable, they're incredibly active feeding their fledglings and they need protein then. So that's exactly when you want them to be hungry because they're feeding their babies all that high protein rather than the seeds. It's actually the, the animal protein of caterpillars, slugs and snails. And it just seems to create this really brilliant cycle um, of, of, of sort of virtuous cycle. And actually Adam now is writing a whole book about this because it's just so fascinating how um, the woodland and the garden by slightly in a way skewing your environment in a way artificially because you're, you're bringing them in and you're then allowing them to build up their populations. We just find things like amaranth, which is quinoa of course. So the amaranth mm -hmm. family, fantastic for garden birds late in the year. The millet is absolutely brilliant. Another beautiful grass called Panicum frosted explosion is absolutely mar really pretty, but also the, the blue tits love it. And then another thing called the shoe fly plant, Nicandra physaloides, which is this lovely Chinese lantern seed head, but in it, inside it, it has a really generous sized mini apple, almost like a little crab apple in the apex. And you'll see from September onwards, the blue tits are just piercing them with their bills and they're just going straight in for that apple and they hollow it out and it doesn't matter to the plant. It still looks wonderful, but you, you're just feeding them. And so they then go into the winter pretty, pretty healthy and well fed. And they then, if you give them enough um, sort of places to harbor over the colder months, 
it's it's yeah it's a it's a good it's a good story to tell and so we're carrying on with that that's a great story to tell so i mean are you saying that you really get no slugs and snails uh, in your garden now yeah pretty much i mean honestly but then of course you know if i if i give everyone a pound for finding a slug or a snail okay um, they will find them but i mean and then water is incredibly important because that really helps as well so we're putting in ponds here for for um for toads and frogs um and they are fantastic at at keeping down particularly snail populations um but slugs too but the birds are doing that pretty well the, 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 you need thrushes as well and that noise that you hear on an april morning the dogs are barking now um <laughs> that is that is a thrush you know eating a snail on a brick or yes. a stone it's and a good noise that it's like yes please thank <laughs> you very much help yourself and what about um the other kinds of natural pest controls that you can do like carrots and onions marigolds different yeah. colors there are there are all sorts of things scattered through your book about stuff yeah. you can just do to make your place properly organic yeah. Um, so that I, I reckon if you would choose one family, it would be the Tagetes, which are the African or sometimes called French marigold family. And they come tiny, like red gem or red jewel, which is really tiny, which we use a lot under our tomatoes. Or they can be taller. Um, and we use a lot of one um, which is called Linnaeus burning embers. And it's a beautiful cut flower, actually. But we scatter that all the way through both our indoor and outdoor spaces. And we use it for picking. It's an edible flower, but it's also absolutely fantastic insect attractant of the right sort. So lacewings and ladybirds. And um, it's got quite a strong uh, smell. I mean, I, I quite like it, but it's quite it's slightly sort of ointmenty smell. Mm -hmm. And um, it just really protects so many things. So we definitely use that all through the greenhouse looks fabulous and keeps it very very clean and that kind of ointment smell it, it somehow is associated with cleanliness but it but it genuinely does and that, um, that's because the um like the ladybirds come to the marigold as such and then they will eat the white fly or the exactly. black fly or whatever yeah, yeah they're larvae right they're meant to eat like oh and the other thing don't hate your earwigs earwigs are splendid uh aphid um eaters so, so a lot of people find um, earwigs spooky because they look like scorpions and they've got those sort of um, those pincers. Yeah, those pincers. But that when they're hatching, they're young. Um, they they feed them huge quantities of aphids. Right. And so, whereas in our dahlia bed, we used to put this bamboo cane with a pot on top full of straw. Um, I'm afraid to say we used to take them out and burn the straw with the earwigs in it. We now actually do the same, but we'll move that straw nest into the greenhouse and put it under our tomatoes. And again, it's just as another thing that helps make sure that if any aphid comes in, uh, goodbye, that's it, matey, because you've been eaten by an earwig as it's hatching its young. Um, and there's very good research on this uh, by the Westmoreland uh, Westmoreland Fruit um, Research Centre down in Kent, and they found that there was a particular grub eating a lot of the apples, and they introduced um, earwigs, and it got rid of the grub, and so they they measured the harvest over three seasons. It's written up on online, so you can see it, and um, and the earwig orchard had a much better productivity. Yeah. Um, and so it proved that the anecdote, uh, the guy who's brilliant and all this kind of stuff is Dave Goulson. Oh, yeah, the insect guy. Yeah. Yeah. And his his research is just so fascinating and you know, all done at Brighton University. But it, it's really, really good. And uh, he was the person who told me about that study. Do you think we used to know all this stuff and that we lost it? Or do you uh, yeah. feel sometimes you're discovering something new? No, I do think we did. Um, I think sort of granny knew kind of thing, but then unfortunately granny reached for the insecticide uh, bottle and the and the weed weed all <laughs> weed clear or path clear bottle, um, because it just was easier and it was less hard work. But it's not true actually. I mean, once you get into this virtuous circle, I mean, people used to come up to me definitely ten years ago and say, Sarah, you've hardly mentioned pests and diseases, and you know if you do the RHS course you know the whole th not the whole thing but an awful lot of it is on pests and diseases it's like 
No, because mm. we don't really have them. And I, that sounds sanctimonious and pleases myself and patting myself on the back. But the honest truth is, as you know better than anyone, if you just decide absolutely to go organic, it takes a while. And I lost whole trials to leather jacket, larvae and things to begin with. But once you get your soil and your, your environment into a good state, you just don't get that. You don't get that sort of wipeout with flea beetle. We get flea beetle here, but we don't get wipeout by flea beetle. And you do no-till? We do now. So if we're, we're on very heavy clay, I literally, if you go into the field over there, you will have, um, you know, an inch, two inches of black stuff on top of classroom clay. I mean, it's right. like really yellow, like butter. Um, and, and gradually I've had to just improve that uh, by adding grit as well as muck from the farm. Um, and it has, you know, it's taken a while, but I did cheat originally and I did, I did till um, by using a, that, as, as much of that topsoil as I could possibly get, mm -hmm. pile that onto beds and then take the paths into the clay seams. Okay. So I put the differential and then into that, like with sort of butter, you add granulated sugar. So I did add five to six millimeter pea shingle on the bed and mixed it in. And then I added loads and loads of organic matter. And that's like flour and apple crumble topping. And originally I started digging and then just, you must be joking. I then hired a rotavator and just used the blades to mix those three ingredients together. And that we did that for about five years, but now we haven't created a new garden here um, for 15 years. So I haven't had to do that again. Cause once you've got, you've used your topsoil and you've got a sort of decent depth sort of, I still say inches, I'm afraid, but that kind of eight to 12 sort of thing. Right. You can then move to no dig. So you can move to Charles Dowding. But I, my view is to import that much organic matter over a whole garden like this um, would, would be slightly suspect, I would say, because we just weren't going to create as much as that. But on a small scale, sure, you can, you can buy your compost in and just pile it onto your clay in a raised bed. But because we were creating a whole garden, I had to do the till to start with. Yeah. And now, do you, do you find you get any weeds? In your not nature? really. Not really. I sound so sanctimonious. And probably no, not at all. I mean, I think it's brilliant. <laughs> um, um, because we mulch. We just mulch, 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 mulch. So we do now have our own pretty efficient composting system. And we mix our compost with our well-rotted manure from the farm. And we just, we just mulch all the time. So whenever we're doing a new planting, we'll never leave bare soil saying, hey, lovely yeah. lovely soil come come and get us weeds um so we'll just mulch and it's very open structure and this and the weeds just don't they're not happy in it and if they are and they start to root we'll just hoe them off really quickly but um yeah it's it's i mean the sort of gardening i do is not labor uh it's not what i would say um well it takes a bit of time. <laughs> well, that's also very nice. Um, we've got lots of questions coming in, but I just want to talk to you about the whole thing you write about, about, you know, planting friends together. Because, yeah. I mean, I've always been very taken with, and indeed last summer we tried it with the three yeah. sisters planting, which is yeah. um, beans and corn and a squash. Yeah. And it went wrong because yeah. the bean grew much faster than the corn grew in the middle. So mm -hmm. the whole theory that you had the bean climbing up the corn mm -hmm. and then the squash keeping the base nice and damp, that bit worked absolutely fine. But in the end, the bean just spread all over the garden and Bloody. it was kind yeah. of fine, but it didn't do that beautiful thing. Um, so no. what, what were we doing wrong? You weren't. I'm afraid. I do think, as, as you know, this was um, a, a system that was used by the Native Americans. And it's, I think it just needs more light than we can give it. So corn just doesn't do as well in this country. It needs a longer growing season than we can give it really. Right. Um, and so you can get these super sweet early varieties that, that have been um, bred for our grayer, uh, shorter season, but they're still not gonna get that height. And so the point is that I think it really needs a, a, a really more like 120 days sort of growing season. We probably have 90 here or whatever. And so you get that going and then up the bean can go and it won't swamp it. And, and then the squash, yes, as you say, um, will canopy over. 
But again, it, it takes ages to get going squash here because it's just cooler in May. It's just cooler here than than in many states in the States. And so I've like you, I've I've failed. And so I've tried then two out of the three. And even last summer we did corn and beans. And it, to be honest, it didn't work brilliantly well. Um, and then the rats got some of the corn. <laughs> but, um, it's yeah, I th I I mean, we may have lots of people here who've succeeded with that system of the three sisters, but we haven't even in Sussex. And you know, it's pretty it's pretty sunny here compared to lots of parts of of the UK. So I would say we just don't have the light levels to achieve that. Okay. Oh, well, I feel I feel better about that. So the other thing that intrigued me reading your book was you said about cucumbers with sunflowers. Yes. Now, what's that about? So, well, they, I don't know what it is. And actually, I really should know that. But they do seem to have a symbiosis. But again, it's just the thing. Cucumbers aren't hugely vigorous climbers. So they'll get to kind of about a meter and then they tend to stop and you don't have to do that pinching. Um, and particularly the variety we grow called La Diva, which grows these lovely, very sweet, very crunchy mini um, they're sort of Cypriot uh, cucumbers. Um, and what we find is with the sunflower, as long as you get it going, so we actually plant them out as seedlings, so they're getting going well, and they will then romp up and then the cucumber, we just turn them towards them and they will then, the sunflower just provides the cane basically. And that has worked really well. And those both um, are things, both particularly if you go for a variety that, that does well here, like Valentine is one that we find works really well. So Valentine with Cucumber La Diva is, is a nice marriage and, and that works, yeah, that is a good one. Thank you, thank you. So listen, it's now, uh, somehow or another, it's gone by so quickly, it's now become quarter past seven and I'm going to turn to the questions. So do put more questions in, although I have to say, I have got quite a lot and I'm just going to kick off. So Angela Harman wants to know if she should plant potatoes in a different bed from last year. In other words, should they be rotated? They should, they absolutely should. Potatoes are one of the few things that I really adhere to that. And so we will have a rough drawing of where things have been. I mean, we're not religious in that plant rotation, but potatoes are one of the things, because you don't know if one, there's an old little seed potato left back in, and that is where you might well get blight or, or black rot. So we do rotate because the blight is, your, is, your, is the bane of all of our lives. And we haven't had it badly in this country for a few years because we've had these very dry summers, but you know, we don't know. But the blight would be in the soil. Yeah, so it's a fungal, right. but the spores will then re-inhabit. Okay. And, and you may not know that there are spores there. I mean, you probably will, because you'll probably know that you've had blight. But as soon as you put the host plant in, as it starts to grow, the spores will infect and you'll then re-perpetuate the blight. So potatoes are one of the things that we really do quite strictly move around. And we put them as far away from where they were last year and the year before as we possibly can. Fantastic. Holly Jessup wants a general, she says, general question. A lot of trouble getting cuttings to grow either in water or straight to soil. Propagating tips, please. Okay, so it slightly depends what, but I do think basal heat for cuttings is incredibly effective, particularly with soil cuttings and black pots, because then the black conducts the heat up the side from the propagator base and you get this lovely warm environment. And so you put your cuttings only around the outside of the black pot, which is warm and cozy, but in fact breaks the root as soon as it starts to form. And really counterintuitively, that's actually what you want. So it forms its tap root, it hits the black plastic on the edge, which is attracted to because of the warmth, and it breaks. And that then is like pinching out the tip. By breaking off the root, you then get lots of rootlets forming. So you'll get a, a cutting rooting much more quickly. As far as water rooting, I find it incredibly successful with basil, as well as mints, of course, so some of the herbs. But I think then transplanting it into soil, we often get quite high losses. So on the whole, I tend to root into, into, into free compost, yeah. Okay, um, Camilla Croydon asks if we can see your pictures again at the end, which I think we probably can do and we'll do our best. Joe says, if a lettuce looks like it's going to bolt, can you take the heart out to stop it bolting? You don't like to take the heart out, do you? Well, I do, but it's a really good question because as soon as it starts to bolt, you want to stop it so you get more leaf. Unfortunately, with lettuces, once it's on the move, 
that you know pretty much that's it so what i tend to do is i tend to plant in in groups or blocks or lines of one lot and if i see one bolting like shooting for the heavens i will try and pitch that out or i might even take that plant out but i will then do the ka-ching cut over the whole line right because you'll know that following on the next day or the next week, the whole load will go. And that's where I would do ka rather than picking round. Because hopefully if you do the ka which is cutting off an inch above the ground mm -hmm. and water, you hopefully will hold them for another month or so. So you'll get more harvest. Oh, that's, that's great. Um, does the April planting apply to the north of England? Well, it's true. I've evolved that here. So I probably would add three weeks i would say so um you know at, out of the midlands and further north i i would say you have to sort of judge by your microclimate but you know for, for instance rosie and i were talking before we haven't yet got daffodils out here whereas rosie has but you will know how far behind you are but i would say probably um you would be saying early may if you're at high altitude and further north and thank so you. Thank you. That, that was the question from Caroline Pinney. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to go over because I think we've talked about no dig and we've talked about some good permaculture pairings and come on to actually something that I completely failed to ask you that coming in a question from Caroline Bunker about your winter salads and herbs grown in heated or unheated greenhouses because I know actually all the way through your book you talk about it's a really good idea to have some indoor heated space whatever it's not, for. not heated. Your, not, not heated, but just indoor space. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, I would say as a vegetable grower, or any gardener, the first bit of kit that I would recommend that anyone gets is a cold frame. And that is how I started. So 30 years ago here, I built myself a cold frame. Well, two, in fact, one heated base, one not. And then in pots or even you can fill it with soil as long as you put compost bags around it so that you can then get it out back to the grip base again but just sow your salads into that in sort of September, October. And then if it's a nice day, you can have the, the lights up, the roofs up. If it's not, you can close it. But what we find is we, I mean, I have genuinely been picking from the same roots here of all these plants I talked about at the beginning. So the Mitsunas, the mustards, the winter herbs, et cetera. I've been picking from them as soon as the tomatoes came out at early October and the salads went in, same root has produced, you know, Countless, mm -hmm. I mean, hundreds, if not 200 meals through the winter, picked twice a day by all the staff as well as me. And so, you know, it's not a massive bed. I mean, it's 20 foot by eight foot or something. And by doing the picking round quite religiously, and then if any start to bolt, as they will in the next three or four weeks, you do the kaching. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're not heated. It is not heated greenhouse. It's just literally protecting to sort of minus three, minus four only. Um, and a cold frame or a polyton or a greenhouse. If you've got it and you're using it for tomatoes in your summer months, for goodness sake, use it in your winter months for, with these hardy um, salads. And that's the cover of the book. I mean, that was a bowl of salad in February. Yeah. Um, question here about living. I mean, I know that you started uh, living in a flat in London, limited balcony space. Any tips you recommend for veg growing in these conditions? Yeah, so that one of these water <laughs> which is hellish to get up in a flat, up, you know, up into your balcony. But you are so much better off with one big container than lots of littles because watering the littles in the in sort of the sort of summer we had last summer, you just you just won't do it. And and unless you're really there all the time, because you'll need to water morning and night, whereas a big water trough. Uh, and if possible, with an irrigation, one of the Gardena irrigation systems, doing maybe three minutes in the morning only. Uh, and if it's really hot, you might want to do three minutes in the evening. And, and then you can just use your whole balcony space for one of these with one of these containers. And honestly, again, this cut and come again stuff. You can just harvest and harvest and harvest and harvest. So you're using every bit of outdoor space. Um, as efficiently as possible but one big container rather than lots of littles is really key because what you'll get better soil structure in the end yeah and more water retention right. and more food retention so again feeding with a liquid seaweed fertilizer with this irrigation or just hand watering it for the similar amount of time it just makes it much more manageable little pots just there's huge evaporation happening all the time and mm -hmm. so you just you up the amount of work by sort of you know, tenfold, twentyfold by going little rather than large. Um, here's another question that I should have um, asked you myself about 
the current vegetable supply crisis? Uh, a, what do you think? And B, what do you see as solutions? Um, so what do I think? Well, I do think the more we get back to using all our outdoor space, even with guerrilla gardening, etc. Yeah. I mean, I, I met some people on Saturday um, and I was on a panel with a group of six or seven people, none of which had any outdoor space at all. But what I convinced them all is just having a window box with rocket or something is incredibly well worth doing. And I just think in a way not just thinking that the corner shop or the supermarket or whatever is the answer to all our eating, both in terms of health, but also taste and enjoyment is, is not a bad thing, but it's, it, it, you know, just taking us back to reacquiring a few basic skills and confidence, you know, that it's incredibly easy to do and incredibly rewarding. And with the cut and come again, salads, etc., it's just, it's a fantastic thing. And there was a part B of that question. Well, it was really about what what solutions, and I mean, I, I think you've sort of answered it yeah. in the sense of saying we all need to grow something, or we could all yeah. grow something, and, which and at least empowers I, you. When I was working at the hospital, and I had no time at all, I had window boxes on all the first floor um, of the flat, uh, window boxes with Tumblr Tom tomatoes in. And it was rather brilliant because neighbours in sort of August and September would walk past and look up because mm. the pavement below was stained red because I wasn't managing to pick them all because it's such a prolific variety. And so, you know, just getting seedlings or you can sow seeds now. It's absolutely perfect time for sowing tomatoes. Or if you don't want to sow seeds, you can buy seedlings in the next six weeks or so. Put them in a window box as soon as the frosts are over. And in, a, in an urban environment, particularly in London, I mean, that will be by the end of April. And then by the beginning of July, you'll start picking those tomatoes and you'll be picking them until the end of September. Um, and they really are. They just keep producing, keep producing as long as you keep picking them or they drop to the pavement below. Um, great. Katie Robinson says her sugar snap peas did terribly last summer. I think they were eaten by slugs and snails. Any tips? She is on a patio. She says they're in plastic planters on lakes on my sunny patio. So what? The snails and the slugs climbed up. A, they've got to get to the patio and then they've got to get up the lakes. Yeah, I would say, I don't know if she direct sowed straight into the container. I would say sow them into gutters and get a really decent size seedling, perhaps that sort of height. So, you know, good, good three, four inches and then plant them out from there. And by then they should be getting away. And also, of course, these are climbers. So if you've got a big problem, one, you've got to keep checking for the slugs and snails, but copper tape is good um, in a container, but also get them growing quickly upwards. So little, I mean, bamboo canes, I use silver birch because I, I prefer it, so-called pea sticks or hazel, mm -hmm. any twigs from the garden and get them growing up quickly because that's when they stop being vulnerable. It's when the little shoots coming up and they just get mown off every night that they will end up giving up. Um Jeremy asks what vegetables you'd recommend for a corner of a garden that gets shaded once the trees, once he gets to May, once the trees leaves come out. Rhubarb, well rhubarb well in, and more rhubarb. rhubarb. More so, rhubarb. Is rhubarb. there anything else? <laughs> yes. Um, rhubarb loves dappled shade, very happy in shade. And actually, the win the, the winter salads, one of the reasons they're so good in the winter is they hate it hot and dry. So I use in that sort of shady situation, I would use all the cut and come again things we've talked about. So the mustards, the mitsunas, the cut and come again lettuces like cocard. So put them there. But you do have to be on mega slug and snail alert with that, because, of course, in the shade, it's more moist. And so your slugs and snails are going to be higher. Um, population will be attracted to that area. So you've, you've got to be super alert on that. But you couldn't do vegetables that are more sort of sugary you they wouldn't like being in the shade I mean, no. could you, they like full sun not that i can think of that will grow in shade again a few of the herbs mint will grow happily in shade mm. need a bit of moisture but it will grow happily in shade there aren't so many rhubarb is is my sort of stock answer and i adore rhubarb but um yeah beetroot will just about do it in shade um doesn't love it but it, it's such an easy vegetable while we're just briefly on the subject of rhubarb, why does it go quicker if you put it in the dark? Oh, because it's looking for light. So it's basically bolting its search. Towards the light at the top of the thing. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, 
Rachel asks, I've had very variable results with peat-free composts. What do yes. you think about the choices? I agree with her on that. Yeah, very much. So uh, it's incredibly difficult to give advice on this at the moment because it varies. One brand will be really good one year and then the next year it'll be less good. So uh, Josie, our head gardener here, has been trialling peat-free compost here for eight years. And whereas, you know, one year New Horizon will be fantastic, the next year Dale's foot will be fantastic, whatever. But right. then, so then we think, ah, we found our medium. But then the following year, we'll get some things that are just struggling in it. And one of the huge problems at the moment is amino pyrrolid contamination, which is a whole sort of subject in itself. And I know we're running out of time. I know, but, but tell us what it is. You can't leave us on that. No, it's a herbicide <laughs> used against ragwort. And the thing is, we might all think, well, what's that got to do with us? Well, unfortunately, lots of golf courses and certainly pony and horse stables and paddocks use it to kill ragwort. And right. it's the only thing. And even um, it has such a long half-life. So it can have been sprayed onto the field and it will actually have a half-life of three years. So it could then go through the gastrointestinal system of a particularly a horse or a cow and be pooed out and it will still be active. And we've had huge problems with this. We lost a whole dahlia trial to this and a whole tomato trial uh, four and five years ago. But what we now do to make sure we haven't got amino parallel contamination in our peat free mixes is we do a broad bean test and we sow just a tray of broad beans, which are very quick to germinate. At this time of year, they'll germinate in two or three days. And if they come up looking perky and green and happy, particularly in a deep compost, then you know you've got really good, you've got a good mix. Okay. But if they come up slightly weird and sort of gnarled and they've got quite a lot of black marking, that is almost certainly amino pyrrolic contamination. And unfortunately, it's incredibly out there in quite a lot of bad composts at the moment, um, and including the peat free ones, really tragically. Um, and it's because it's in the whole manure system. Right. And so if you could, you know, some of them don't have manure in at all, but particularly the peat freeze rely on manure for the moisture retention. So it, it's 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 not an easy, you know, it's it's difficult to give an easy answer to that because it's quite complicated. Golly, but, well, that's I mean, you sort of feel you ought to know one ought to know about that. Yeah, they ought yeah. to stick on their bags that this is not great. I mean, presumably it's very strong if it knocks out ragwort. I know how tough ragwort is. Well, and that's the thing is, even if it's only a trace amount, it's got this, it's got this very long half-life as a chemical. Right. And so it's still active, even in really tiny concentrations, which are almost impossible to prove they're there. But what we've found is the broad bean test is the most reliable test, really. Well, thank you. That's, that's very... A bit, a bit of a slightly, negative end. Slightly though. depressing, last yeah. note. So I'm going to ask you the question, um, which Joe has said, um, I adore your cookbooks. Can we have another? <laughs> well, yes, funnily enough, um, Garden Cookbook is being republished, actually, because um, it's out of print, which I did 20, 15, 20 years ago. And I am going to do another one. But I'm so keen on getting my gardening stuff out there while I'm still running the garden and I'm trialing and testing things. And so I sort of feel I can still do cooking when I'm very old and I'm quite old now. But so the, the cookbooks will come after a, a, a series, these practical series of gardening books. Well, I look forward to that too. But I have to say, I don't know if you can all see this. It's kind of not doing very well on my slightly phased out background. But anyway, a year full of veg, a harvest for all season is a total treat. And Sarah's just given us a sample of all the things that are in this book. Um, it's a great read, as well as being really, really full of fascinating things that I thought I knew a bit. But I have to say, I felt very overwhelmed by it at the end of it. And um, Look at the beautiful end pages. That is so lovely too. Yeah, they're, it's really, they're really great production. Um, Sarah, thank you so much for talking thank to everybody. And Jack, if there's any chance of putting up Sarah's photographs at the end, that would be great. Please um, buy the book. Um, please come back and join us soon. It's been lovely to see you all. Thanks so much for all of you for joining in and have a really good evening. And Sarah, bye-bye. Thank you. And huge congratulations both on being 60 and on writing this book. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Bye. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.